this month, our first guest was elected to the United States the Senate. His best-selling book is entitled Dreams from My Father. Please welcome from the great state of Illinois, Senator Barack Obama, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Nice to see you. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Well, thank you for uh, right, right off the top here, t tell me, what were the dreams from your father? What is that referencing? Well, you know, my, I have a mixed up background. First thing people ask me is, where where'd you get that funny name? Mm -hmm. uh, Barack Obama. Although, they, you know, you had a top ten list, but you, you missed a couple. Yeah, ways to mispronounce Barack right. Obama. I mean, there was uh, Alabama and uh -huh. Yo Mama. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, you know, my father was from Kenya, from mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, and he was part of that first generation of students that came to study in the United States, and he met my mother, who was from Kansas. And uh, so th what the book references is sort of what his ambitions were coming to this country and some of the disappointments he went through and, and sort of the uh, difficult times that my parents went through as, as people of, of different races and backgrounds and cultures. When, when you were a, a child, did you know that you were uh, trying to emulate his wisdom, or it was only till not until later that you realized what he was you know, teaching you? Uh, Lyndon Johnson, who I don't quote that often, had a, a, a great saying. He said, uh, every man is trying to make up for his father's mistakes or live up to his expectations. Yes. And I think that I was probably trying to do both. I think in some ways he made a lot of mistakes, especially with his family. And I was, I've tried to compensate for those, but uh, he was uh, a very bright man and, and a very uh, somebody who accomplished a lot. And so I think I was trying to live up to those as well. So it's interesting, good and bad, they all provided lessons for you. They all provide yeah. lessons for you. Uh, and and you, as, a, as a kid, you were in Hawaii? I was in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think the main reason my wife married me was because I still have family in Hawaii. And she figured... <laughs> she's on vacation. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. You uh, know, you, she's from Chicago. <laughs> she's thinking. Yeah. I've been looking for a warm Chicago weather for a while. <laughs> Um, and uh, let's talk about, the, was I right about you've been in the uh, state uh, senate for... I was, I was in the state senate for eight years, and then uh, I decided to run for the United States Senate. And mm -hmm. people's general estimation was uh, he'd probably be the best U.S. senator. The guy's uh, done good work, but uh, he's got no money, he's got no organization, and, right. and nobody can pronounce his name, so it's not likely he's going to win. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing about your name, it's easy to pronounce, and it's, it's cool. Well, I, th th that's what I think. Yeah, that's yeah. what I think. I, you know, uh, there were some advisors who told me to uh, change my name. Really? Yeah, and uh, somebody suggested Cat Stevens, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I decided, I decided uh, that wasn't going to work. Uh, uh, other than uh, uh, usually the mayor of Chicago is named Daly. Right. I know very That's little it. about <laughs> Illinois politics. <laughs> uh, Jane Byrne, I guess, was in there for a while. Yeah, and yeah. Then, uh, uh, now, was there a guy who was running for Senate, maybe an incumbent, maybe not, may, I think a Republican, yeah. and he had a problem because he and his wife would go to strip clubs and have sex? Well, did I dream that? Or? <laughs> it, I, Does any of this <laughs> ring a bell? I, uh... There were some issues, some allegations. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, we didn't we didn't touch that stuff. I see. We 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 took the high road. Now this is who you were running against. Uh, he well, I, I, out, right? he, he he dropped out. Uh, you know the Republicans. Uh, you know they seem to have a lot of fun given all their moral <laughs> value stuff. Uh, they, yeah, they they enjoy I, themselves. It sounded like fun to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but he was the uh, seated senator. Is that correct? well? No, he he we it was an open seat. Open and seat. so we were running against each other. He dropped out, and then. Um, the Republicans for about a month and a half couldn't find anybody out of the 12 million people in Illinois to run against me. And <laughs> so they finally brought in this guy from Maryland, uh, Alan Keyes, yes. who uh, who's a pretty intense guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that didn't work out too well for them. And, and, and now uh, you uh, one of the keynote speakers at the Democratic Convention, Which and is. your star is certainly beginning to rise. Well, I, you know, it, it was a great honor speaking uh, at, the, at the Democratic Convention. It, it's a big crowd. Yes. You know, there are like 15,000 people. Yeah. So I walked in. And, you know, it was packed. And people with signs and funny hats. And, <laughs> you know, there are celebrities. You know, Peter Jennings is yeah. down on one end. Right. And Puff Daddy's over here. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, uh, I turned to my wife. I said, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of a big speech. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling kind of nervous. And, and, and my wife's wonderful. She, she held my hand and looked me in the eye. And she said, honey, uh, don't screw it up. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, well, that's exactly Which what was, you need. What I needed. That Absolutely. Uh, all right, we got we got plenty uh, to talk about. I, I want to, and I don't know if this is even in your jurisdiction as a senator, but that uh, uh, Pistons Pacers game. Oh, that, 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 that was a problem. Right. We we'll need to legislate something. Right, we'll on see that. what he can do about that. We'll be right back here with Barack Obama. Everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Beale. I was uh, surprised uh, to learn that uh, currently uh, there are no African American senators there other than yourself. None. You're the uh, uh, current one now. When I get when I get sworn in, I will be the only one. Is it, that seems uh, hard to believe now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we, we need to make some progress on that front. And, and there's going to be a gentleman joining me, Ken Salazar, who will be the only Hispanic uh, United States senator. So uh, yeah, we're going to have a, a a small caucus. The yeah. Uh, <laughs> and in, is, how, how many uh, African-American uh, senators have we had in the history of We the have had five. There were two during Reconstruction. They were basically appointed by mm -hmm. the Union armies. <clears throat> and then there have been three who were elected. Right. So, so we, we've got progress to make on that front. But one of the nice things about my campaign was that you know, people, I think, anticipated me just getting votes from the black community mm -hmm. or just from the city. And, and we ended up winning in places like Iroquois County and... Kankakee County and Sangamon County, and as you might anticipate, there may not there, there aren't a lot of African Americans in those places. Well, and, I, and I'm guessing that there are more congressmen, uh, African American yes. congressmen. Uh, but uh, does, does this in in the African American community does this have the kind of disenfranchising effect that one might think that they're, they're, the representation at the Senate level is I, you small? Know, I, I think it's a problem. The part of the problem is is that uh, you, you've got to run statewide. And for as opposed to just these congressional districts, and when you run statewide, there are no states in the union where African Americans are majority. You've got to raise a lot of money, and African Americans oftentimes have difficult times raising the kind of money that's needed yeah. for these TV ads. Uh, so it, it's a challenge. But I'm hopeful that as a consequence of my election and, and uh, the the terrific. Uh, uh, faith that the people of Illinois placed in me that we're going to be able to improve on that uh, around the country. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, w what do you think of uh, things since the election? First of all, did, what, did the election surprise you? Did, did the Democrats make mistakes? Did everything go right and it just didn't work? Or what happened? No, I, I think we made some mistakes. Look, you've got to give credit. George Bush had one of the best political teams that's ever been put together. Uh, they ran a very smart campaign and a tough campaign. Uh, and we made some mistakes. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I think John Kerry picked up steam right at the end, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we probably lost some opportunities. What were the mistakes? Well, you know, I, it's always easy to second guess. I, I think uh, probably even John would acknowledge that, you know, windsurfing uh, is, is, you know, that, that you probably want to play softball or something, uh, uh, you know, just to kind of, kind of relate to folks more. Have you, um, uh, have you uh, met the president? You must know the president. I, well, you know, he called me. He was very gracious after the, after the election. He, he gave me a call, and, and we both agreed that we had married up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, then, and then he invited me over to the White House, and, and uh, we had breakfast uh, with uh, Dick Cheney and Carl Rove, and it was a real fun time. Yeah, it sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it sounds like Mardi Gras. Oh. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, what, what is the status now? Uh, the, the Senate is pretty much hamstrung uh, by the president? Is that Well, the, uh, look, look, look I mean, you've got Republicans are in charge mm -hmm. of uh, the White House, the, the Senate, and, uh, and the House of Representatives. So in terms of sweatshirts, you're going to have to go talk to them. I, <laughs> I, I, can't, uh, I can't help you. I don't know why these prices are so high. What, what do you do as the new guy? What is that? Yeah, they be? make you sharpen pencils. Yeah. And, you know. Uh, is, is there any kind of indoctrination? Are there uh, seminars or? Well, we, we had an orientation last week, and you know they describe for you, uh, you know, how the process gets started and, and how to hire up a staff. The, the biggest challenge, uh, though, I think for somebody like myself is just making sure that you're answering the mail and answering people's. People get angry if you're not responsive. Right. Uh, I mean they want to know your position on Medicaid and Medicare, but the most important thing they want to know is when they send uh, a letter about their Social Security check that That's somebody's right. responding That's to them. Right. So we're going to have to spend a lot of time just yeah. focusing on that and, and folks back home in the state of Illinois. What, what do you know about uh, uh, Colin Powell, uh, Secretary of State? Was, did he quit or was he pushed out? Well, it, what's clear is that he was not the, 
the advisor that really had the ear of the president. Mm -hmm. And I think it, people would acknowledge that generally, that the president had more confidence in Condoleezza Rice and, and uh, Donald Rumsfeld. And I, I'm, I'm sure he felt frustrated over time. He had a different vision of how our foreign policy should operate. Now, I don't begrudge the president his right to hire the person that he thinks mm -hmm. best represents him. And, and the nice thing is now when Condoleezza Rice goes overseas, I don't think people are going to second guess. They know that they're talking to somebody who's got the president's ear. What, what happened at that uh, basketball game in Detroit? Honestly. <laughs> I, uh, now, now, my, I said, I said this earlier in the week. From looking at it, I have to blame. There's two things that I think are responsible. Uh, the fans and being drunk. <laughs> Because yeah. everything was okay, everything was basketball until Ron Artest gets pelted with a beer. Then that's not basketball. Yeah. And I know there's, there are professionals who are supposed to rise above it and supposed to just look the other way. Right. But my God, uh, you know who, who really puts up with that? Yeah, honestly, yeah. nobody except politicians. I mean, uh. I think the, uh, <laughs> it looked like Washington. It was uh, it was a melee. Uh, I, you know, I, I played basketball, and you know your, your emotions get sure. riled up and. Sure. But, you know, I think everybody's got to step back. It, I think it, it is an example of a culture generally where, um, you know, people are quick to anger yeah. and, and people, I think, take out their frustrations on each other in ways that aren't appropriate. And, and I think both in our politics, in our sports, in, in our day-to-day -day interactions, uh, you know, we should be able to, to be a little more uh, agreeable. Right. Yeah. And, and will something be done to change it, or will the, we just wait until something really, really, really ugly happens, yeah. and then it will change automatically? You, you know, I think, I think part of what has to happen is people have to set a tone. Um, you know, one of the things I'm proud about in our campaign is we didn't run negative ads. You know, what we said was we can disagree with mm -hmm. somebody, but that doesn't mean they're, yeah. they're bad people. And, and I think that part of what happens in our politics and, and in other walks of life is that we spend a lot of time vilifying and, and denigrating people who don't agree with us. And, and, and that's something that our children pick up on. They, they see that on television, they, right. they, they hear it in their leadership, and, and they start acting that way. Paul and I run negative ads. I, I, I do. <laughs> Against each other? <laughs> it just doesn't make any difference. We don't care. Um, <laughs> but the, now, the other thing that I found disturbing about watching, I didn't see it during the game, I just saw the endless replays of that episode. I, I was watching it, and I just couldn't help but say to myself, eh, it's kind of cool. You know, it, it actually, you know, it, it sort of was. Yeah. It's a little different yeah. in the form of basketball. You, you, you sort of like that. Yeah, I, it's just like, and then, and then at the end when the big tubby guy comes out and just says, all right, somebody poof me, and, and then Jermaine O'Neal comes out and just, okay, boom! <laughs> it was kind of yeah. cool, don't you think? Dave, th this is what I was talking about. You're, I see. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're contributing to the coarsening of the culture. Now, listen. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah. too late. Uh, no surprise there. Now, listen. Uh, you make me a promise now, yeah. and, and, and you know what I'm talking about. When you run for president, when you, whenever, when you run for president, and I have the feeling, and you have the feeling, just you come back and see us then, all right? Well, I, I hope you invite me before that. All right, all right, but we will. <laughs> but when you make the run, you come back and see us. All right, a pleasure. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Barack Obama, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back with Jessica Biel. Gentlemen, it's a uh, thrill for us and quite an honor to introduce our first guest this evening. Please welcome the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. Just say this uh, when when I say the words, ladies and gentlemen, Barack Obama, President of the United States, and I look over, and it's you <laughs> walking over here. I get a little, you know, kind of a thing. 
it's it's overwhelming well uh, I feel kind of overwhelmed I, I am so honored to be one of your last guests now let me ask you about the, uh, that. that's a big deal I was thinking about this today uh, many, many days when I wake up and I find out what I have to do during the day there's a couple of things where I say oh god <laughs> now are you saying that's how you felt this morning? No, <laughs> no I'm saying this. Uh, <laughs> no, but when they this this interview isn't starting well. It's fine. I, I thought after it will all this down. time. Don't worry. No. Okay. So when you are reminded that the day is today, do you say to yourself, "Oh God, today is the day I have to go see Letterman"? No, I'm excited about it. The uh, first first of all, uh, Mich. I know you like Michelle a little bit more than me. Oh my God! Which is okay. She was here last I week. I know. Which and and uh, I assure you, you are not alone. <laughs> but uh, but I'm not going to let her uh, have all the fun. And and mainly, I came uh, by to to say goodbye to Biff and Paul. Um, <laughs> who, let's thank you, Mr. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. That's fine. the band says goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. But they said I couldn't get on the set unless I also spoke to you. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but I, I want to tell you, your, your uh, wife, and I've met her, uh, I don't know, four or five times in various circumstances. Uh, and and she, yeah, last week, she brought with her your own Marine Corps band. Pretty cool. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And uh, you're just seeing it. You can't, the hair on the back of your hand stands up when these uh, men and women they're, march They're in. amazing. And, yeah. and, and I don't know if she mentioned it. First of all, these folks are all active duty. And they can play anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you want them to play jazz, they'll play jazz. They want them to play classical. Yo-Yo uh, Ma came by the White House one time, and suddenly he sat down with them, and they were all... Sure. Playing uh, cello suites, and uh, I mean, uh, you you name it, they can play it. And in the meantime, they're also putting their life on the line. Uh, it, it is one of the great honors of uh, the presidency to be their commander in chief. Right. Well, to hear that kind of live music it's that great. close to it is, is a remarkable They're thing. Terrific. And uh, these are people in the Marine Corps yeah. for, uh, they've made this a career? Well, it, they made it a career, but as I said, they're not just playing music. They're, yeah. they're serving uh, in all kinds of ways. And, and, and a guy in a huge bear uh, skin hat brings them out. He's, he's with, serious, too. The thing, yes. Right. <laughs> and then they have a whole different conductor. And yes, yes they do. Play. And these are the guys that You were really paying attention. That's good. Oh, eh? man. <laughs> That's good. I was. Yeah. Well, anyway, your, your uh, wife was uh, uh, delightful. And, uh, man, uh, just w what a great asset to, to have uh, for the representation of the administration, representation of, of women, representation of Americans. She I does great. She is. I'm, I'm lucky to have her. And, uh, you know, um, and, and, and I'm sure she talked about everything she's doing for uh, military families, which has become such a passion for her. Uh, you know, we travel all around the world, and everywhere you go, you've got uh, our members of the armed services stationed, and they are away from their families for uh, months, in some cases years at a time. Sometimes the families are moving as well. The kids uh, are adapting all the time uh, to new circumstances, and they are uh, great ambassadors for us. But part of Michelle's mission is to make sure that we're uh, standing by them. Right. When, when they come home, we've got to make sure that uh, they've got the kinds of benefits that they've earned, that their housing, child care, all those things are taken care of. And she, her and Joe Biden have done a great job on it's, that. Issue. It's an easy mistake. Yes, absolutely. It's an easy mistake. To believe or to assume that once they come home and are no longer in uniform and defending our country, that their lives will be just fine again. Well, that, and, and, you know, we've got a, a lot more work to do. Because of the length of the Iraq War, the Afghan War, we've got uh, well over a million people who are coming back. And uh, they are incredibly talented. Part of our mission is to communicate to employers, if you want to get the job done right, hire a veteran because they will do it they come, like yeah. nobody's They're ready to go. They're ready to go. Ready to go. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue with the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Thank you.
that um, if you had been here three months ago or four months ago, we would have been talking about one thing or another. Uh, six months before that, something completely different. And, and it seems to be that each one of these is, is epic in its tragedy, uh, uh, obscenely uh, tragic. And now uh, the topic that has consumed us all for the last couple of months, uh, for example, uh, the situation in Baltimore. Right. But that's one of many situations we could be talking about here tonight. Uh, how do you feel about that? What can be done about that? What went wrong there? What continues to go wrong around the country? Why? Well, well first of all, uh, it's important that uh, now that charges have been brought in Baltimore that we let due process play itself out. You know, those officers who've been charged, they deserve uh, you know, to be represented and to let the legal system work its way through. We don't have all the facts yet, and that's going to be uh, presented in a court of law. Uh, I think it's also really important to remember that the overwhelming majority of police officers are doing an outstanding job. We're in New York today. Uh, we're in New York today where a, a young officer lost his life uh, uh, doing his job and uh, you know, families, officers all across the country every day, they're wondering is my loved one going to come home? And so they've got a really tough job. What we also know, though, is that for far too long, for decades, uh, you have a situation in which too many communities don't have a relationship of trust with the police. And if you just have a handful of police who are not doing the right thing, uh, that makes the job tougher for all the other police officers out there. It creates an environment in the community where they feel as if, rather than uh, being protected and served, uh, they're the targets of arbitrary arrests or stops. And so our job has to be to rebuild trust. And we put forward a task force made up of police officers, but also young activists who had been protesting in Ferguson or here in New York. They came up with some terrific recommendations about collecting data on uh, what happens when there's a, a shooting involving police? What are we doing in terms of things like body cameras? Uh, and so there's some very practical, concrete things we can do to make the system work better. But, and, and this is something I, I reminded people of uh, the other day, this is not just a policing problem. You know, what you have are pockets of poverty, lack of opportunity, lack of education, uh, all across this country. And too often we ignore those pockets until something happens. And then we act surprised and the TV cameras come in. And essentially we put the police officers in a really tough spot where we say to them, just contain the problem. And so if young African American men are being shot, but it's not affecting us, uh, you know, we'll just kind of paper that over. And part of the message that I'm trying to deliver is, look, you've got a crisis in these communities uh, that's been going on for years where too many young people don't have hope they don't see opportunity there aren't enough jobs we've created a uh, an approach to drugs that leads to mass incarcerations so then you have no father figures in these communities when those folks get out of prison they can't get a job because they got a felony record so uh, today part of what i did in new york was to uh, announce some adi additional initiatives around what we're calling My Brother's Keepers. How can we send a message to uh, young people of color and uh, minorities, particularly young men, saying your lives do matter, we do care about you, but we're going to invest in you before you have problems with the police, before uh, you know, there's a, the kind of crisis we see in Baltimore. We're going to make sure you got early childhood education. We're going to make sure that you, uh, uh, you have an opportunity to graduate and go to college and you've got mentors and apprenticeships and, and that kind of sustained effort I think is what we have to see in this country not just the episodic uh, uh, you know uh, spasms of uh, interest when something tragic happens now, the, the uh, conditions that yeah. the conditions that you that you mentioned uh, uh, poverty and uh, lack of education uh, affect uh, all people. Uh, d d d is that what creates racism? Is, is racism the factor, a factor, a residual factor? You know, I think a, a residual factor, but also a buildup of our history. 
And you know, we can't ignore that. It, it, look, if you have slavery, Jim Crow, uh, discrimination that built up over time, even if our society has made extraordinary strides, and I'm a testament to that, and, and my children are, you know, you know my, my kids and your kids are growing up in, in an America uh, where, uh, you know, the attitudes of the next generation make you hopeful because I think they genuinely try to judge people much more on the basis of character, well, but, but, but it's built up over time. So yes. if, if you have a uh, hundred years in which certain communities can only live in certain places, or the men in those communities can only get menial labor, or uh, they can't start a particular trade because it's closed to them, uh, or you know, if they're trying to buy a house or a car, it's more expensive. And over time, that builds up. You know, that results in communities that, where the, the kids who are born there are not going to have as good of a shot. And we don't have to sort of accuse uh, everybody of racism today to acknowledge that that's part of our past. And if we want to get past this, mm -hmm. then we got to make a little bit of an extra effort. And, and I think the vast majority of Americans are willing to do that right. if it's done well. Well, I say this all the time. Uh, I'm, uh, I remember uh, the, the 60th anniversary of the march in Selma, yeah. uh, and, and when I hear about uh, 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 what seems to be a hate crime, a racist uh, motivated crime, I, it's like when you hear about tuberculosis coming back, you think, no, no wait a minute, right. I, I, thought, I thought that had been taken care of. And, and, and I have always thought that generations going forward yeah would learn from what you described and be smarter about it and more aware about it and understand that for the love of God, it's human beings and that's all it is. Well, I, and I think that, Dave, I, I mean, I think that this country is leaps and bounds uh, better than it was uh, in a fairly recent past. I mean, when, when I was born, uh, it was uh, illegal in many states for my parents to marry. That's not institutionalized today. Some of the problems that we see in terms of law enforcement, that used to be the law. I mean, that, you know, the notion that police would potentially be held into account, uh, that, that, that was uh, you know, not at all uh, what the custom was uh, around the country, and in some cases, not what it was on the books. But we have to be vigilant. It, you know, it's like tending a garden. Uh, this country, our democracy works because ordinary folks, well-meaning people, each and every day are trying to make it a little bit better. And we're teaching understanding to our kids. And when mistakes are made, we acknowledge them as opposed to trying to cover them up. And most importantly, in my mind, we think about not just our own kids, but we think about all kids. And when we say to ourselves that that child in Baltimore has tough circumstances, but that child is worth in the eyes of God just as much as my child, and we need to make sure we make an investment in them. When we get to that point, then not only does that child do better, but the country as a whole does better, and that requires the kind of sustained commitment that I'd like to see. And, and irrespective <clears throat> of what we've come through recently, and it just seems like once a week there's something god-awful. Irrespective of that, you believe that race relations in this country are better, stronger? I, I think that they are better. Part of what's happened is, is that we just know more mm -hmm. today than we did. I mean, for example, this is a, a slightly different uh, circumstance, but, but it sends, I, I think, a message about what we need to do. Uh, when it comes to things like uh, sexual harassment or sexual assault or date rape. I don't think that it happens more frequently today than it did 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Part of what's happening is we've become more aware mm -hmm. of what women have been going through for generations. And so uh, part of us fixing it is being aware of it. Well, a lot of the things that we've seen in Ferguson or New York or Baltimore have been going on a long time. We're more aware of it in part because when you see something on video, it's a lot harder to deny. Uh, and communications have improved. And that's a good thing because 
You know, the, the, the first step in, in curing any problem is being able to diagnose it and acknowledge it and not hide from it. And you know, we still have racism in our midst. We still have uh, you know, problems of, of ignoring poverty in our midst. Kids are locked in situations where it's very hard for them to pull themselves out uh, unless they get some help. And the more we're aware of it, we can solve it. The, the one thing I know about America is that when we decide to solve a problem, we can solve it. And this is solvable, and I think the vast majority of people want to solve it. But in order to do so, we can't just engage in a bunch of uh, you know, rhetoric and, and engage in, in finger pointing. We have to come together and say, you know, what works and how are we going to make it better? And there are cities all across the country where police chiefs are working with activists and clergy and others, and they're saying, we want to get beyond this status quo, and uh, I'm confident if we seize the moment, we can uh, really see some serious improvement. Let, let me ask you another question. Is, is this the first country you've presidented? <laughs> You know, uh, it is, it is, I suspect, uh, the first and last country that, I, <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm presenting. Uh, right, I am, uh, unlike, uh, unlike late night talk show hosts, I am term limited. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> we'll be right back with President Barack Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, I, here's, um, uh, as you know, uh, and as your wife has told you, uh, most of everything I say is born of ignorance. Uh, and, and the free trade agreement, uh, individually I know what those words mean, together I have no idea. Help us out here. Well, you know, 95% of the world's markets are outside the United States. We're, uh, you know, the biggest... Uh, and most innovative e economy, although just by sheer size and population, China uh, it obviously has caught up. But if we're going to succeed economically, then we've got to be able to sell our goods to other countries. We can't just sell here in the United States. And for the last six and a half years, we've dug ourselves out of what was a terrible recession. Uh, the economy's growing faster than most of the other advanced countries in the world. But the next step is to make sure that our exports are going to places that are growing. And the big place where we're seeing a lot of growth is in Asia uh, and in the Pacific region. So what we've done is to put together a, a trade deal with 11 other countries. And the objective is to have high standards so that our businesses and our workers aren't disadvantaged. Some of the past trade deals that hurt us, that led to uh, a lot of manufacturing leaving the United States was because we didn't have any enforceable strong labor standards in these countries or environmental standards in these countries, so it was an uneven playing field. And they could make stuff real cheap, right. they're polluting, they're employing child labor, mm -hmm. and then they're selling back here, and our folks get undercut. The idea here is you lock them into higher standards, strong labor protections, banning child labor, making sure that they're not engaging in some of polluting activities. But and we then have legitimate competition. And that way we've got an even playing field. Yeah. It's, it's a fair playing field. And, and it's going to be important partly because, look, China's out there competing in these areas. And if we don't write the rules, they're going to be out there writing the rules. And studies have shown that when we enter into a trade agreement with other countries, our companies, they compete. They do well. When China enters into a free trade agreement with, with some of those countries, then, uh, frankly, our companies are disadvantaged and we end up uh, getting the short end of the stick. So we've got to be in there. We can't just close ourselves off. And I know that in the past, sometimes people are suspicious of trade deals because they've seen communities that got devastated, plants closed, uh, jobs left. And what I'm saying to folks is the, the lesson from that is to get the right kind of trade deal. It's not to think that we can somehow close off ourselves from the rest of the world because we're going to have to compete. We've got to sell out there. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to succeed. It's, it's interesting to, to me now, uh, occasionally and more and more frequently, you will find something. You buy something, and it's proudly championed as having been made in the United States. 
And uh, it, I think that's pretty telling as to how far things have shifted, yeah. that now that's something yeah. that, that we're heroic about. When well, the, the, the good news is, and people don't know this, uh, we're actually seeing companies move back. Manufacturing's been growing under my presidency faster than any time since the 90s. It's advanced manufacturing. So, uh, you know, we're making the high-end stuff. Our workers are still better than anybody else's, and our innovation is still the best. But you know, we, we're not going to be able to compete on the low-end assembly stuff. They, there's always going to be lower wages somewhere, which is why we also have to make sure we're providing our kids the best education and training them to compete. Because what they need to be doing is uh, you know, figuring out how to work a computer or a very complex piece of machinery to make advanced stuff as opposed to the low-end stuff. But we're succeeding at that, partly because we got great workers, we got great universities. This is also why we got to invest, though, in job training and research and development to keep our competitive edge. And, and let me ask you about uh, uh, tangential to that or essential to that education in this country. Yeah. Uh, from talking to your wife and what I know uh, outside, it, not where we want it to be. Not to, uh, we, we've got some great schools, and our universities are by far the best in the world. But too many of our kids are not up to the levels that we're seeing internationally. And, you know, the first thing to do is to make sure we're honoring our teachers, treating them like the professionals that they are, paying them a decent salary. Um, and we, we also have to uh, look at the data, and it turns out that, if, that the kids who fall behind, typically it's because they're coming from uh, households where there aren't as many books, you know, maybe their parents didn't have educational opportunity. And if, if we provide them early childhood education, it pays huge dividends all the way through. So we've got to make sure that we focus on the earliest uh, parts of school. We'll be right back with the President of the United States, everybody. Like two years, two years, two years plus till uh, the election, uh, and you don't have to really get in that melee. You you will a bit here and there, but it must be uh, relaxing to know that you're not out there on the front line. And uh, second part, what will you do when you leave the White House? Well, first of all, Dave, it is less than two years. Uh, just the uh, not that I'm counting. Um, <laughs> But I, I just want to make sure you don't show up, like, in the middle of January to vote, and <laughs> well, everybody will be like, <laughs> Sorry, what, what happened? No, the election's in November of 2016. Um, you, you think I'm dumb, don't you? No, I didn't say that. You're distracted. You got stuff going on. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it, it, it does feel good not to have to be right. on the stump. Uh, the stakes are big, though, so I want to make sure that everybody's paying attention. Uh, it'll be a highly contested election, as every presidential election is. And, uh, you know, whatever your political affiliation, I just want to make sure you, you, you listen to what folks are saying, get informed on the issues, and then, most importantly, go out there and vote. What will you do when you're not president? Uh, well, I was thinking, you and me, we could play some dominoes together. And, dominoes. You know, All and, right. Uh, the, uh, we can, uh, you know, go go to the local Starbucks and you know, <laughs> I, I, I wanna, swap stories. I, I, I want to say something <laughs> that the president said to me during the commercial break that I uh, was very impressed by. He <laughs> said to me, "So when when you retire, what are you, what are you planning?" He says, "Are you?" He says, "Like me." He says, "When I leave the office, he says I plan on taking a month off." <laughs> Are you kidding me? After eight years of this, you're only taking a month off? Oh, my goodness. Well, the, uh, you know, my, I'll be a pretty young guy when I, when I get out of here. I mean, I'll, I'll be 55. Mm -hmm. And uh, Malia will be in college, but Sasha will still have a couple of years left. And you know, Michelle and I, I think, are going to continue to want to do the things that, that right. uh, we care about in a different capacity. So... Uh, we hope to be able to help young people get opportunity. We hope to continue to help our military families. Um, you know, I, I, uh, 
I hope that you know, I'll be able on issues like climate change that will, are generational challenges uh, to lend my voice and most importantly to encourage people to continue to get involved in, uh, in, in politics. And, uh, but I, I really like the idea of playing some dominoes with you. Though. I play dominoes. I'm pretty good. I know you think I'm no good at dominoes, but I'm pretty good at dominoes. And I plan to teach law at Columbia. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. I, uh, I, you know, I, I'd be interested in uh, sitting in on that class. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, that would be a, that'd be a hoot. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, yeah. for heaven's sakes. Uh, I don't know quite what to say by expression of uh, gratitude here. Uh, it's particularly meaningful to me uh, because I think like most Americans we feel we know you. Uh, you've been kind enough to, to be here many occasions. Your wife has been here many occasions. And uh, you hosted us at your home in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, uh, and all of these have been very meaningful to me and uh, to my family. And uh, I can only wish you all the best. Well, life. Dave, let me, let me just say this, and, and, and I mean this sincerely, and I know I speak for Michelle. She probably had a chance to say it herself. Um, you know, we've, uh, uh, we've grown up with you. Uh, the country, I think, has, you know, after a tough day at the office or coming home from work, uh, knowing you've been there to, to give us a little bit of joy, uh, a little bit of laughter, uh, it has meant uh, so much. And you know, you're you're part of all of us, and so well, thank for you, you to uh, thank you very much. But you've given us a great gift, and, and we love you. You were we you were very funny at the correspondence dinner. I'm pretty dinner. funny guy. <laughs> I'm pretty funny because I learned watching you. No, so. now do you do you have guys writing that stuff? <laughs> the uh, no no. <laughs> I came up with it all myself. <laughs> said, okay. I meant what I said. We love you, Dave. I we love really you do. as well. God bless you, Mr. President. All right. Good luck, man. Thank you. All right. President Barack Obama, ladies and gentlemen. Our long national nightmare is over. Letterman is retiring. <laughs> You're just kidding, right?